what is cosmic energy? The religion is the solution for the things happening all around the world. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim. Jihad basically means to strive to struggle. The Hindus and the Muslims will be united. He is not cosmic energy, he is more superior than that. Quran gives you the solution to the problems of humankind. Not that we shall despise each other. That according to Japan, India will be the superpower of the world. We will be a superpower, will be far superior to the American. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahabi ajmain, amma abad, a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim, bismillahi r-rahmani r-rahim, udu ila sabri rabbika bil-hikma, wal mawazit al-hasna, wa jadul millati ahasan, rabbi shahli sadri, wa yisilli amri, wa halul ugdata min lisani yafqahu kawli. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. You're most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compared religion. So if there are any questions, you're most welcome, brothers and sisters. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, what is the concept of God in Sikhism as well as in Sindhism? Do they consider Guru Nanak is to be God? The brother has a question. And what is the concept of God in Sikhism and Sindhis? Both are different, brother. Sindhi means a person coming from Sindh. He can belong to any religion. So Sindh is a geographical area. So if you come from Sindh area, you're called a Sindhi. So basically, a Sindhi can even be a Muslim or a Hindu. Majority are Hindus. But it can even be a Muslim Sindhi if you come from Sindh area. So it's a geographical definition. But most of the Sindhis, if they're Hindus, they're the same concept as Hinduism, which has been discussed by me in the other lectures. As far as the concept of Sikhism is concerned, regarding Guru Nanak, I've discussed this in detail in my lecture, concept of God in major religions. And the Sikhs don't believe Guru Nanak to be God. What the Sikhs believe, the word Sikh is derived from the word Sisya, which means a disciple. Sikhism is a religion of ten gurus. And it was originated, it was founded by Guru Nanak Sahib. Towards the end of the 15th century, in the land which was watered by the fire rivers, which are known as Punjab. So Sikhism originated there, and it came towards the end of the 15th century, and it's a religion of ten gurus. And the last guru is Guru Gobind Singh. Guru Nanak is the founder, but they don't consider the gurus to be God. They consider them to be people who have guided or somewhat similar to messengers, somewhat similar. Their holy scripture is the Guru Granth Sahib, also known as Adi Granth. And Sikhism is a religion which believes in five Ks. First is the Kesh, that is uncut hair. Then is the Kala, that is the bangle or the bracelet. Then is the Kirpan, which is a dagger. Then is the Kanga, to comb the hair. And the fifth is the Kacha, that is the long underdraws. So they believe in maintaining these five Ks. But as a concept of God, they believe in one God. And the definition of God that any Sikh can give from his scripture, the best is he can quote you the first chapter, the first verse of Guru Granth Sahib. It's known as Japuji. It says that God is true. He's called as the creator who doesn't have a beginning. He's not begotten. He's free of fear and want. He's compassionate. He's merciful. So the concept of God, the main core, is somewhat similar to Surah Ikhlas in Islam, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul Allah ahad, says Allah one and only. Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute eternal. Lam yulid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kuffanad, and there is nothing like him. In Sikhism, they believe that God is one. And in the unmanifest form, he is called as a omkara and manifest form as Omkara. And there are various attributes given to Almighty God in Sikhism. If you read the Adi Granth, the Guru Granth Sahib, various attributes, for example, he's called as the Kartar, that is the creator. He's called as Akal, that is the eternal. He's called as Sahib, which means Lord. He's called as Parvartigar, which means cherisher. He's called as Kareem, the beneficent. Rahim, the merciful. And he's also called as Bahai Guru, the one true God. And Sikhism doesn't believe in Avatar Vada, which the Hindus believe Almighty God taking forms and coming down. They're strictly against idol worship. So hope that answers in brief regarding the concept of God in Sikhism. Are there any brothers who like to ask a question? 
السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ وائی از اٹ دیٹ ان اسلام دی حرام فار مین ٹو ویئر گولڈ ائٹمز لائک رنگز واچز اینڈ ادر سٹف ویل ہیز اے کوسچن دیٹ جینٹس کین ناٹ ویئر گولڈ رنگ اور چینز حدیث تو محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے صحیح حدیث ویئر دی پروفٹ محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم سیڈ دیٹ ڈونٹ ویئر سلک اور گولڈ فار دی جینٹس ڈونٹ ویئر گولڈ اینڈ سلک اٹس اے کمانڈر اف دی پروفٹ مسلم لیفٹ اوبے اتی اللہ تی رسول بٹ دی لوجیکل ریزن دیٹ آئی کین تھنک اف دی ریزن نو گیون دی حدیث دیر نو ورس ان دی قران سیئنگ دیٹ gold cannot be worn or silk cannot be worn but there are very sahih hadiths but the prophet said don't wear we will not wear the logical reason we can think of is that these are signs of extravagance and more of show off and the quran said in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 27 that all those who are spent thrifts they are brothers of the devil so logically what we can think is that it is more of showing off wearing gold wearing silk it is a sign of showing off and even today you don't find poor people wearing that so it is more of an extravagant sign showing off that is the reason i feel that the prophet has prohibited it hope that's the question any brothers assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah how does a person offer salah where the sun rises for 6 months and the sun sets also for 6 months the brother asked the question that in places there are some parts in the world where sun is there it rises and is there for 6 months doesn't set and in the other part of the world for 6 months it sets and doesn't rise so how do people offer salah as far as offering salah there are some parts mentioned in the quran the timings even the sahih hadith there are five times you offer salah immediately from dawn to sunrise is the first fajr salah then immediately after sun reaches its highest point afternoon is the zuhur salah then in the evening before sunset is the asar salah immediately after sunset is the maghrib salah and late in the evening early in the night is isha salah five times you have to offer salah it is based on the sun the rising and the setting these times but there is also verse in the quran which says that look at the mother of the cities that mother city is makkah so where there are problems where there are extreme conditions of sunrise and sunset because the earth rotates and depending upon the rotation of the earth the day becomes short and long depending which part of the earth you live in and towards the pole if you go towards the pole and towards antarctica and arctic there we find that there is six months day and six months night so in these times there are two options either the city which has a normal timings that you can follow even for salah even for fasting for fasting also we have to start the fast based on the sunrise and end it at sunset so based on these even for fasting and for salah we have to follow the timings of makkah either or the country which is the closest to which have normal timings which is feasible for human beings hope that answers the question brother the answer you have given is from an islamic scholar's point of view or is it from quran or sahih hadith i have told you see in islam the sharia is derived either the verse of the quran or the hadith or what the sahabas have done then there is a qiyas one is ijma then qiyas qiyas is derivation from the quran and the hadith for example The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number ninety, anything which intoxicates is haram. But the actual word used is khamar, which was used for wine. But the broader meaning is anything intoxicates. So if you ask me, is there any verse in the Quran which directly mentions that drug is haram, cocaine is haram? Directly no. But intoxicants, yes. So that is called as kiyas. Kiyas means using our analogy, using our thinking or logic, but it should be based on Quran and Sahih Hadith. So then we say. by logic by kiyas even drug cocaine is haram so similarly when the verse of the quran say that look at the mother of the cities there are hadith is saying that so here again we extend and we say that based on this rule it is a unanimous agreement there is no difference of opinion so when it comes to kiyas there are chances for example previously there was a fatwa that smoking was makru why because when a person smoked and the breath did cause some problems to the neighbors smoking breath so based on the hadith of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that when you have onion don't go for salah after having onion because it will cause bad breath so based on that hadith they say that smoking is makruh but today we have come to know that smoking causes lot of damage to the health it's nothing but so poisoning according to world health organization more than 4 million people die every year only because of smoking lung cancer heart attack very reason so nothing but so poisoning so based on the verse of the quran of surah baqarah chapter 2 verse number 95 that do not make your own hands the cause of your destruction the own hands 
the cause of a destruction. So suicide is haram. So based on this, majority of the ulmas today, the scholars, more than 400 fatwa that smoking is haram. So this is based on chaos. So similarly, even about salah and about fasting is based on chaos. Hope that answers the question. Any brothers have any questions? Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, brother. If there are people who believe in the oneness of God, can we call them muhaid? Can we live with them like the kitabis, that is the people of the book? I am referring to the Sikhs. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, brother. If there are people who believe in the oneness of God, can we call them muhaid? Can we live with them like the kitabis, that is the people of the book? I am referring to the Sikhs. My brother has a question that anyone who believes in the oneness of God, can we call them muhaid? Can we call them kitabis? See, the person who believes in tawhid, one is seeing and one is practicing. Just by saying you are a Muslim, you are a namesake Muslim. You practically become a Muslim when you actually submit a will to God. You may be saying you are a Muslim, but you may not be offering salah, you may not be believing in one God, you may be doing shirk. So label is not important, practice is important. So anyone with the name of Zakir, Sultan, Abdullah, Muhammad may not be a practicing Muslim. So labels are something else, practice is something else. Similarly, what the religion says of Sikhism, believe in one God, some Sikhs may be believing, some may not be believing. So individually you have to check up whether that particular human being is actually following on Tawheed or not. Then you can call him Mahid that he is one who believes in Tawheed. But whether or not, Allah will not question you whether your friend actually believes or not. You have to dawah to him. Right? You giving a fatwa is not important. If you know he's doing shirk, for sure you have to dawah to him. It's not that if you are doing shirk you can't keep friendship with him. You can't go to him for ultimate help. But you can be an acquaintance and do dawah to him. Regarding kitabi, there's a word in the Quran called Ahli Kitab. Ahli Kitab means people of the book. But in the Quranic context, it refers to Jews and Christians. In the broader sense, anyone who follows the revealed book is called Ahli Kitab. In that context, even Muslims are Ahli Kitab because they believe in the Quran. But in the Quranic context, it's specifically referring to Jews and Christians. So Ahli Kitab mentioned in the Quran refers to Jews and Christians only. But in the broader sense, anyone who believes in the revealed book is called Ahle Kitab. Or you call it a Kitabi, that's your word, but Ahle Kitab is the word used in the Quran. So in that context, Muslims are also Ahle Kitab, but please note, not according to the Quran. When Quran refers to Ahle Kitab, it specifically refers to Jews and Christians only. It's in context. But generally, anyone who believes in the revealed book can come into the broad category of people of the book. But whether the book they follow is revealed or not, we only know by name only four. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. All the other books may be, may not be. We don't know. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rath, chapter number 13, verse number 38, Allah says, Likulli ajidin kitab. In every age have we sent down a revelation. So, there are several revelations sent on the face of the earth. But by name, only four are mentioned in the Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. Torah is the Wahid, the revelation, which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahid, the revelation, which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahid, the revelation which was given to Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So by name we know only four, but there were several revelations. So all the other books that claim to be from God, I say maybe they were the word of God or maybe they were not. I can't say for sure they are. Even the present Bible today, we cannot say it is the Injil. It is a corrupted form of the Injil. So all the other religious books, if they claim it is the word of God, I can say maybe it is, maybe it is not. But even if it was the word of God, it was meant for those people and for that time. All the revelations that came before the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, they were meant for a particular group of people and the message which was revealed was meant to be followed till a particular time period, till the next revelation came. But Quran, because it's the last and final revelation, it was not sent only for a particular group of people or only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was sent for the whole of humanity. And Allah gives this message in several places. In Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1. In Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. In Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 185. In Surah Azumur, chapter 39, verse number 41. That the Quran was revealed for the whole of humanity. And because it was the last and final revelation, it was meant for the whole of humanity and is meant to be followed till the last day of judgment. 
So even if uh, the scriptures were the word of God, it was meant for those people in that time. Today, all the human beings, whether living in India, whether living in America, in Canada, in UK, in Singapore, in Malaysia, they should follow the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, and last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam My question is, as bird flu is around the corner, BMC has given guidelines to the doctors to discourage handshakes and uh, poultry products. So you please kindly advise. But they said the guidelines given by BMC that doctors should advise the patient not to do handshaking and not eat poultry products. I haven't heard this news. I don't know whether the news is right or wrong, so I cannot comment on that. But as far as the information, yes, handshaking opposite sex, na meram haram. So I'm with them. Opposite sex, na meram, handshaking, girls and boys, male and female, na meram, opposite sex, haram. Within the same sex, male and male and female, female, no problem. The several hadith, shaking hands, fine. It is mustab, no problem. Regarding eating poultry products, recently, there's a bird flu, which is there through the world. Initially, it started in 1997 in Hong Kong. Later on in the year 2002, 2003, 4, 5, it spread to Europe and other countries, Indonesia, etc. Later on, it was identified in India, in Maharashtra, in the state where we live. So because it was identified, the government is taking all precautions about this. And many newspapers have reported that in today's headline, Times of India also, that bird flu. And there are reports that maybe one person has died. And so far about 190 people in the world have died in this past few years. Human beings have died. So this is a disease which originates mainly in the poultry, in the birds, etc. And it can go on to the human beings. And there are chances human beings can die. There are symptoms like cold, like cough. There can be conjunctivitis also. But the report also says that eating poultry products doesn't cause you to get infected by the disease. And if you cook the hen or the chicken very well above 70 degrees, it's very safe. It will mainly come by contact. So handshaking with the chicken is a problem. <laughs> See, I don't know where you got this from. So handshake with the chicken may be a problem. So the doctor says that don't touch the chicken and it's going to fast. Because the main infection is direct contact. And if that human being who touches the chicken, so handshaking with the people who are selling poultry products also can be another extension to it, you know. Those people who are dealing with poultry and selling of chicken and handshake with them, it can be a problem, it's fine. But otherwise, I don't know of any medical reason why handshaking among the human beings should be stopped. For what reason? Why? Unless the person who is shaking hands on a hygienic person is dirty and that's a different thing. But I haven't read in any medical book why handshake should be prohibited. Poultry products because of certain diseases that have come. But this disease particularly, bird flu, the medical science says it doesn't spread by eating as long as you cook it very well. It mainly spreads by direct contact. So that answers the question. Any sisters have any questions? Brother, can you explain more on shirk? Sister has a question that can I explain more on shirk? Sister has given a talk on concept of God major religions where quite a major portion of my talk is dedicated to this. Shirk sister in Arabic means associating partners. It means sharik, becoming partners. In Islamic context, shirk means associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Almighty God. Shirk, in Islamic terminology, means associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is shirk and is the biggest sin. And as far as Islam is concerned, other religions, they believe in monotheism, but Islam, besides monotheism, it believes in tawheed. Tawheed is Arabic word which comes from the root word wahda. It means to unite. It means unification. And there are three categories of tawheed. The first is tawheed al-rububiyah. The second is tawheed al sifat And third is tawheed al-ibadah. In the first tawheed al-rububiyah, it means unification and agreeing that there is only one God. And he alone is the sustainer, the cherisher of the whole universe of all humankind. And everyone is dependent on him and he is independent of anyone. This is first Tawhid al coming from the Arabic word Rabb, meaning Lord. The second is Tawhid al Sifat. That means unification in maintaining the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, this is categorized into five types. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, should only be called by those names which He has called Himself, and no other names. 
Point number two, he should be described only in that way which he has described himself in the Quran or the description given by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Point number three, any qualities of Almighty God cannot be given to any of his creation. For example, Almighty God is eternal. You can't say I know of a human being who is eternal. Almighty God has got no beginning. You can't say I know of a man who has got no beginning. Point number four is the name that he gives to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It only belongs to him and no one is. You cannot give that name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to anyone else. For example, Rahman. You can call Abdul Rahman. Khalik. Or Allah. So you cannot give that name Rahman to any human being or Allah to anyone. You can call Abdullah the servant of Allah. So when you want to give a name to human being, give something else. If you want to use the name of Allah, you can say servant of Allah, Abdullah, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Karim. And the last is that those things which are unique to the human being, his creation, cannot be given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, human beings can make mistake. You can't say God made a mistake, Allah made a mistake. So you can't attribute the qualities of his creation to Almighty God. So these five categories come under Tawid al Asma Sifat. If you break any one of these categories, it is going against the concept of Tawheed. And the third is Tawid al Ibadah, that means worshipping only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one is. Only believing in one God is not sufficient. In monotheism, you only believe in one God. But in these three categories of Tawheed, besides believing in one God, if you associate partners with him, even that's called a shirk. And there are various examples in the Quran, for example, it says that when you ask these pagans that who is the creator, they will say Allah. Who is the person who has power in the heavens and the earth? They say Allah. Who is it that gave you life and death? They say Allah. The pagans, not the mushriks. But then Allah says, then why do you associate partners with him? That means when you say all power is Allah, Allah is the power in the heaven, in the earth, he has power over life and death, power over hearing everything, then why do you associate partners with him? So only believing in one God and giving him good attributes, to either Rububiyah is not sufficient. Giving him good names, to either Asma or Sifat is not sufficient. All three should follow. If you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you break any one of the three categories of Tawheed, it is called a shirk. Whether the first category you break, second or third. So here Allah says in the Quran and gives example that the mushriks believe in one God. They give him good names, Allah. But they worship somebody else also. So shirk means breaking any one of the three categories of Tawheed is also called a shirk. And it is the biggest sin in Islam. Hope this answers in peace, sister. Wa akhir da'wan alhamdulillah فَيَا رَبُّ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّلَامُ مِنْكَ السَّلَامُ إِلَيْكَ السَّلَامُ فَيَا رَبُّ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّلَامُ مِنْكَ السَّلَامُ إِلَيْكَ السَّلَامُ لِأَمْرِكَ يَرْجِعُ أَمْرُ الْأَنَامِ بَيْنَ يَدَيْكَ قُلُوبُ الْأَنَامِ لِأَمْرِكَ يَرْجِعُ أَمْرُ الْأَنَامِ بَيْنَ يَدَيْكَ قُلُوبُ الْأَنَامِ